Well, this past Thursday was the NFL draft. And if you're like me and you're starving for sports, uh, you were excited to watch it and to track with the news and to uh, see who your team drafted. And uh, I, I believe I, I saw that this year was the first time in like 60 years where three out of the top six drafts were offensive players, like quarterbacks, to be more specific. Like the first time in 60 years, three quarterbacks chosen out of the top six. And the reason for that is because you need a great offense to win in college football and for sure talking about the NFL draft. You need a great offense to win in the NFL. And the Kansas City Chiefs proved that, right? I mean, with our quarterback, Patrick Mahomes, throwing dimes all over the field, scoring touchdowns, scoring a lot of points, you need a Big 12 kind of offense. You, you need a Patrick Mahomes. You need that kind of offense to win in the National Football League. Well, you need a great offense to deal with people you can't stand. You see, this week we're in part two of a series we're calling Can't Stand Ya. And in this series, here's what we're talking about. We're talking about dealing with people that annoy you or even worse, people you can't stand. What about people you can't get away from right now? Well, in this series, we're, we're chatting about what the Bible says about how to get along and how to fix broken relationships. And I think if we're honest, we would all say the constant like proximity, the constant closeness is a challenge for even the best of relationships, for even the best, the closest of marriages. And I'll be honest and say this season, this time is a challenge for me and for my marriage. And so I said this last week, I'm going to say it again. I'm preaching to myself, to my marriage, to Darby and I, as much as I am to you. And so last week we talked about in part one of this series, we talked about a prevent defense, like how to prevent World War III from happening in your home. And so we talked about that prevent defense. If you didn't catch it, go on our app and uh, get caught up in this series and look at what the prevent defense looks like. And we said that we're going to make allowance for each other's faults. Well, today we're going to talk about offense. You need a great offense to make it in these relationships and, and dealing with people you can't stand. And then next week in part three, we're going to talk about that third phase of the game of football, special teams. And so you won't want to miss next week as we finish up this series. But today, here's what we're talking about. We're talking about offense. You need a great offense when you're dealing with people you can't stand. Now you might be wondering, where do I find this offense in the Bible? Where do I find this offensive scheme in the Bible for dealing people with, for dealing with people I can't stand? Well, if you got your Bible, go to Matthew chapter 18 and let me show you this offense for dealing with people you can't stand. Now, now's a great time to open up the City Church Lubbock app. If you don't have that app, download it in your app store. Just search the City Church Lubbock and then select sermon notes right there on our homepage and the verses and the points. Everything that we're talking about will be right there for you. You can even fill in the blank as we go. And I want to challenge you to do that. That's a great way to lean into this time and get a lot out of this time instead of leaning back like maybe you find yourself doing right now on your couch or uh, in your recliner. But that's a great way, even if you're physically leaning back, like to spiritually lean in by taking notes and filling in those blanks and, and reading those verses along with this. And I promise if you do that, you'll get a lot more out of our time together by actively participating. So let's go. Matthew chapter 18. Jesus says this. Here's, here's our offense for dealing with people you can't stand. Matthew chapter 18. The verses will be up on your TV screen even now. Starting in verse 15, Jesus says this. If another believer, some translations say, if a brother, if another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense if the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. But if you are unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. If the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. 
Then, if he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat that person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. Now, this series, we got the name of this series from a show called Seinfeld, one of the funniest shows ever made. And if you find yourself in quarantine right now with nothing to do, that's a great show, show to go back and watch. But in one of those episodes, George's dad, George Costanza's dad, we talked about George last week, George's dad says that he's not going to participate in Christmas this year because he's tired of all the commercialized things that, that come along with Christmas. And he's going to participate in a holiday he's learned about called Festivus. Now, Festivus is a lot different than Christmas. Instead of a Christmas tree, you get a pole. And you can see a picture of it, the Festivus pole, right now on your screen. Instead of uh, games together, you have what's called feats of strength, where you wrestle each other on the floor. And some of you are like, that sounds like my normal Christmas. Like, that sounds like Christmas every year with my family, people wrestling on the floor. Well, you have feats of strength, and then finally, George's dad says there is the airing of grievances. And that's what happens around the table. Instead of going around the table and saying what you're thankful for and what you thank God for and, the, and what you love about people sitting at the table, uh, George's dad says at Festivus, the Festivus for the rest of us, uh, you go around and you air grievances. And then George's dad says this, I got a lot of problems with you people. And he starts by listing off the problems he has with everybody. Well, in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus tells us how to go to another believer, another brother or uh, someone that we know and air our grievances. He tells us that we need to go face to face with people. We need to go meet with people and tell them the problems that we've got with them. So this offense or this offense rather that Jesus is talking about here in Matthew chapter 18 is a major offense. This is a sin, Jesus says in Matthew 18, if another believer, if another brother sins against you. So this isn't a minor issue. We talked last week about how to deal with and how to make allowance for minor issues. That's not what's happening here. This is a major offense. This is a sin issue. So watch this. A major offense needs a great offense. A major offense needs a great offense. Now you might be wondering how, what's this offense look like? What offense are we running? What offense are we playing? What are we going to call this offense? Well, I don't know about you, but when I would grow up and we'd play football outside with my brothers or, or basketball or, or any kind of sport, and when there was a great play or you scored, you would say in your face, like if you scored a touchdown, you shot that basket and made it, you say, in your face. I don't know about you, but that's what we said growing up. And so here's what we're going to call our offense. Our offense is going to be called the in your face offense. In your face offense. Now, if you've been watching The Last Dance about Michael Jordan and the Bulls, you know that Jerry Krause, the general manager of the Bulls in the 90s, thought that the, his offense, that Phil Jackson's offense, the triangle offense was so good. He thought that offense was so good, he didn't need Phil Jackson. He didn't need Michael Jordan or Dennis Rodman or Scotty Pippen. He thought his offense was so good that he didn't need any of those people. And it ended up being one of the things that blew up the Bulls dynasty in the late 90s. Well, listen, listen, the triangle offense has got nothing on the in your face offense. All right. So let's break this down. Let's talk about the in your face offense. First of all, the in your face offense is played with a familiar face. The in your face offense is played with a familiar face. Jesus says in Matthew 18, if another brother or if a believer sins, against you. So this is someone you know. This is someone you're close to. This is someone you're in relationship with. Specifically, Jesus says it's another believer, but this is also the way to approach difficult or broken relationships with a spouse, with a coworker, with a friend, with someone you know that has sinned against you. Now, 
What's clear from this passage is this isn't talking about someone who's just said something annoying on social media or has done something to bother you. This isn't confronting some random person for doing something annoying. No, Jesus is talking about how to confront a brother, someone you're close to, someone you're in relationship with who has sinned against you. And so this implies, watch this, this implies that you are close enough to and connected enough to get hurt in the first place. This implies that you are connected enough to and close enough to other believers specifically that you could be hurt by them in the first place. So these kinds of relationships can't happen merely online. Now, that's what we're forced to do right now. And you're watching church online, and that's the way that we're doing this for now. But as soon as these restrictions are lifted and we're meeting back together again, you as a follower of Jesus cannot let church online and watching church online become or remain the norm for you. That's not enough. If you're going to be close to other followers of Jesus, like close enough to get hurt, like connected enough to get hurt, it means you are close. It means you are really close and connected to other followers of Jesus if you are close enough to them, if you are connected enough to them to get hurt. So listen to me. You've got to show up when this is over. You got to show up with the body of Christ. You got to show up to a small group where you can get connected with other followers of Jesus so close and so connected that you could potentially be hurt by them. And here's the thing. It's not when or necessarily or if this happens, rather. It's when. It's not if. It's when. When you're in relationship, even with other followers of Jesus, when you're close to other followers of Jesus, you are going to get hurt. They are going to do something because they are broken people. They are imperfect people. They are going to hurt you. You're going to have some disagreements, some hurts that will develop and that will happen in those close, committed, connected relationships with other followers of Jesus. It's just going to happen. And if you're not in a place where you're close enough to other followers of Jesus, where you could be hurt by them, then that's a problem from the outset. You got to start showing up more. You got to start getting in a small group where you're getting connected and close enough to all the other followers of Jesus, where this could even be a possibility for you. But some of us, because we've been hurt by another follower of Jesus or, or hurt by a church, we've run from that situation rather than confronting it with the in your face offense, with the way Jesus told us to deal with that hurt or with that confrontation rather we, a lot of us, when we get hurt by another believer, when we get hurt by a church, we run from that situation or we just go to another church. And listen, that is a unbiblical and immature way to handle our hurt, to handle the sin that's been done against us. Instead, Jesus says this, and here's the second part of the in your face offense. The in your face offense is played face to face. Jesus said, you're going to go privately to that person and talk about what's happened. You're not going to go to other faces and talk about it. No, you're not going to go and gossip about the situation and talk to other people about what's happened. You're going to go to that person face to face. You're going to go privately to that person and talk about what's happened. Proverbs 25 verse nine says this, argue your case with your neighbor himself or herself. Don't go to other people. You're going to argue your case. You're going to present what's happened face to face to the person who's offended you, not to other faces. You're going face to face. The in your face offense is played face to face. So here's what you're going to do. Imagine this. You're going to sit down with that person. You're going to be in the same room with that person. You're going to be at the same table with that person. You're going to look at them eye to eye and you're going to have, watch this, a conversation. 
Now, I know in today's society and with social media and direct messages and text messages and email, those are the ways that we typically handle confrontation. Those are the ways that we typically will deal with our hurt that we face. But Jesus said, when you're hurt, when someone sins against you, you're going to go face to face. You're going to meet with them privately. I know it sounds crazy in today's society, but this is the way Jesus says disciples handle confrontation. This is the way his followers will handle when they've been hurt. Listen to me. Social media arguments are immature at best and unbiblical and sinful at worst. Social media arguments, arguing with people back and forth over social media, whether it's about politics or any number of issues. It's immature at best. It's unbiblical and sinful at its worst. It's not how we're supposed to handle confrontation. It's not how we're supposed to handle hurts or disagreements. We're supposed to, Jesus says, we're supposed to go face to face, sit down with that person at the same table, eye to eye, and talk with that person. I mean, again, if you've been watching The Last Dance, imagine if the the bulls would have done this in the 90s. Imagine if instead of going public, with their drama and with their disagreements and talking about it in the media and talking about it with other people. What if instead Scotty Pippen, Michael, what if they had sat down with Jerry Krause and Jerry Reinsdorf? What if they had talked face to face and they had handled their disagreements and their hurts in the way that Jesus tells us to handle? I mean, the Bulls could have played for maybe another 10 years and won a ton more championships. Because Jesus said, when we're hurt, we've got to go sit down face to face. The in your face offense is played face to face. And then third, the in your face offense is played with a peaceful face. The in your face offense is played with a peaceful face. Jesus says that when you go and sit down with someone, the goal, the idea, the win is if that person listens and confesses. And then Jesus said, you win the person back. So if that's the case, if someone's going to listen to us and confess what they've done wrong after we've approached them, then our approach matters. It's not just what we say, it's how we say it. And so our approach matters. The goal, Jesus says, is to win the person back. It's not to, uh, it's not to win an argument. It's to make peace with that person. So the prize, Jesus says, is the person. It's winning the person back. It's not your vindicated position. No, the prize is the person. How would that change your approach? If the prize you knew on the other end of the conversation, wasn't you being right, wasn't winning an argument, wasn't your vindicated position, but was the person. How would that change your approach? Paul said in Galatians chapter six, verse one, he said this, brothers, if someone is caught in a trespass or a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him with a spirit of gentleness with a spirit of peace, with an approach, with a spirit of gentleness. That's how that person will be restored, will be saved from their sin. That's how reconciliation is going to happen. That's how peace is going to happen. If you approach that person with a spirit, Paul says, of gentleness, with a peaceful face. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter five, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. In other words, Jesus is saying the children of God seek to make peace. It's just in their hearts. It's what they want. That's what they long for. It's what they desire. The children of God, followers of Jesus, desire peace. James, the brother of Jesus, said this in James chapter 3, verse 18. And those who are peacemakers, watch this, will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. 
Let me read that again. James 3, verse 18. James, the brother of Jesus, said this. And those who are peacemakers, blessed are the peacemakers, the the children of God, Jesus said, are, are peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. And peacemakers, James said, plant seeds of peace and then reap a harvest of righteousness. So watch this. You have to plant peace to produce peace. You have to plant peace to produce peace. This past week, uh, my wife called me and said that she had gotten these mats for her gym. She's a personal trainer and she had gotten these mats uh, to go on the gym, on the floor of her gym where she hosts her boot camps. And now those boot camps are done online, but, but she was getting these mats. And, and so she asked me to come and meet her there uh, so that we could get these mats out of her car and I could help them because they were, they were big, they were large, they were heavy so that we could carry them inside and, and, and put them down on the floor of her studio. Well, When I showed up and I opened the door to the car, I saw these huge mats that had just been thrown into her car and were all over the leather seats and were pulling down on the leather leather and and just, I, I, I saw this and I don't know. I don't know what else to tell you except to just be honest. And I was just, I was filled with this anger. Like how could these people that, that threw in these mats, let this happen in our car? This isn't a truck. You don't just throw these mats. This is, they're, they're, these are leather seats. And so I'm seeing these mats all over the car and I, I'm upset and I'm angry. And then, because I'm not at the store to, to take it out on, on the people who did it, I'm asking Dar, how could you let this happen? How could you see this happening and not, not stop this from... And I approached her, let's just say, uh, not with a spirit of peace or gentleness or with a peaceful face. No, quite the opposite. I was planting war, not peace. And so that conversation did not go well. I was planting war by what I was saying and how I was saying it. I wasn't planting peace. And so I didn't get peace. I got war and that conversation didn't go well. You see, if you're going to produce peace, you've got to plant peace. The in-your-face offense is played with a peaceful face. You see, the goal is to produce peace. It's to peacemake. It's to win the person back. It's to have that relationship reconciled, not to win an argument, not to have your position vindicated. The goal is peace with the person. And so if that's going to happen, you've got to plant peace in order to produce peace. Now here's what producing peace looks like according to Jesus. Jesus said, if you plant peace and you get peace in return, you produce peace. Here's what that looks like. First of all, the person's going to listen. They're going to listen. They're not going to get defensive. They're not going to be thinking about what they're going to say. They're going to listen. And secondly, Jesus said, they're going to confess They're going to confess what they've done. In other words, they're going to take ownership of their bad behavior. They're going to take ownership of their sin. They're going to confess it. They're going to apologize. And they're going to ask for God's help to repent of that sin. That's what it looks like for the person receiving the confrontation to plant peace. You're going to listen and you're going to confess. You know, after I drove away from Darby's gym that day. I was extremely convicted about the way that I had talked to her. And so I immediately got on my phone. I texted her. I said, babe, I'm so sorry for the way that I talked to you. I know I talked to you harshly. I'm sorry. And then when she got home, I went to her again and and verbalized face to face, eye to eye and said, babe, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the way that I talked to you. I was wrong. You see, if you want to produce peace, you've got to plant peace. The in-your-face offense is played with a peaceful face. But what happens if you approach the person with peace, face-to-face, privately, with a peaceful face, and there's still no peace? What happens, what do you do if you're 
unable to plant with peace? What, what, what happens if even if you are able to plant with peace, you're not producing peace? What if that person's not receiving what you're saying, listening and confessing? Well, well then what do you do? Well, Jesus says this, two things. You've got to bring teammates into the conversation. They've got to play the offense with you. And so Jesus says this, first of all, the in your face offense, if it hasn't produced peace yet is played then with helpful faces. This could be a small group. This could be a counselor, a third party that can come in and help you navigate the hurt that can help you navigate the disagreement. So the in your face offense If it doesn't at first produce peace, then it's going to be played with helpful faces, first of all. And secondly, it's going to be played with spiritual faces. Jesus said, you're going to take it to the church leaders. And here's why, because you need biblical advice. You notice in both of these scenarios where Jesus said, you're going to take it to others. First of all, you're taking it to believers, other believers, other brothers in Christ who could help you, maybe a small group or a Christian counselor. And then next, you're going to take it to spiritual faces like church leaders who are going to, again, who are going to provide some biblical advice. You're not taking this to people who are not followers of Jesus because the implication there is you're not going to get biblical advice from people who don't follow Jesus. So you're taking this to helpful faces. You're taking this to spiritual faces. But notice each time when you do this, you are still conversing with the helpful faces and the spiritual faces. You're conversing together with the person. This is never a situation where you're gossiping about it to other people or slandering that person and talking about that person behind their back. No, in each one of these circumstances, you're still going with that person that has hurt you, that has offended you. You're still involving that person, Jesus said, so that everything is said can be confirmed by a witness. So you're getting biblical advice. You're doing it together. And then Jesus goes on to say, if you keep reading in Matthew chapter 18, he says, so where two or three are gathered there, I am also to help you solve this problem, to help you solve this disagreement. A lot of times we quote that verse out of context. The context that that verse is in, when Jesus said, where two or three are gathered, there I am also, is for us when we find ourselves in a disagreement where we can bring in outside spiritual help to help us navigate this disagreement, to help us reconcile the situation. And Jesus said, when you do that, when you humble yourselves and you bring in other helpful spiritual faces to help you navigate your hurt, there I am with you. My presence will be there with you to help you reconcile this relationship. But then Jesus goes on to say, if that person still won't listen, then here's what you're going to do. You're going to treat them as an unbeliever. You might be thinking, wow, that... Jesus, that seems pretty harsh. Treat them like an an unbeliever. Well, what Jesus is saying here is if that person still is not listening, they're still not confessing, then their heart is hard and they're not desiring peace. You see, believers in Jesus have received the Holy Spirit living and dwelling inside them. Not only that, Jesus said that when he goes and the Holy Spirit comes, the Holy Spirit would lead us and guide us into all truth and would remind us of the things that Jesus said and would convict us of sin and righteousness. That's what the Holy Spirit does. It convicts us of sin. And so if I've sinned against someone and I feel no remorse over that, if I'm not convicted about that sin, if I'm not wanting to turn and repent from that sin, then it's evidence that I don't have the Holy Spirit in my life. God said about the new covenant that he would take our hearts of stone out and give us hearts of flesh that are sensitive to him. Listen, if someone has hurt you and they're not convicted about it. They're not wanting to make peace. They're not trying to work this out with you. It's probably because they have a hard heart. 
They haven't had that heart of stone taken out and replaced with the heart of flesh that's sensitive to God. A follower of Jesus that has the Holy Spirit desires peace. And the implication here is that no Jesus follower will continue in unrepentant, hurtful behavior. Now they might struggle with it for a while. They may desire to turn from it and they struggle turning from that sin and so they keep doing the same things over and over again but they, but they don't want it and, and, and they hate it and their heart's broken over that. But no follower of Jesus lives in continued, unrepentant, hurtful behavior. And so if you're dealing with someone that's not desiring peace and not wanting to work something out with you, Jesus said, then you've got to treat them like an unbeliever, which means you're praying, you're praying that God will save them from their sin, that they will place their faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of their sin, that their heart of stone might be taken out, that they might receive the heart of flesh, that they would receive the Holy Spirit, that then would give them the ability and the conviction to turn from that sin. Here's our big idea today. A great offense will reconcile a major offense. A great offense, the in-your-face offense, will reconcile a major offense. But here's what you've got to understand about what we're talking about here today, is that you have eternally offended God. Now you might be sitting here thinking, yeah, man, get, get, get my husband, get my wife, get, get my kids, get my, my friend, my neighbor. They have eternally offended God. They've offended me. No, 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 no. That's not who I'm talking to. I'm talking to you. You have eternally offended a holy and righteous God. You have. You see, you've got to understand that first. And God, knowing you would, knowing that you would offend him, that you would break his law, planned his great offense, the best offense the world has ever seen. He planned it before the creation of the world, knowing that you would sin against him, knowing that you would rebel against him, knowing that you would eternally offend a holy and righteous God, knowing that you would do so. God planned his offense before the creation of the world, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1. In 2 Corinthians 5, Paul says this, that God was reconciling the world to himself through Jesus. That's God's offense. Reconciling a sinful world, sinful man to himself through Jesus. And here's how that happens. Here's how God makes peace with us. He sent his son Jesus to die on the cross to pay your fine for sin, to pay my fine for sin. You see, Romans 5 makes it clear that we are enemies of God. We are at war with God in our sin. We've offended God. We've broken his law. We're lawbreakers. There's a fine for our sin, eternity separated from God in a place called hell. But God loves you so much that he sent Jesus to die in your place for your sin. And so Paul writes, when you continue to read in 2 Corinthians 5, he who knew no sin, Jesus, became sin for us so that those of us who are in Christ would become the righteousness of God. In other words, would be right with God. Before the creation of the world, God knew that you would offend him, that you would break his law. And so God put together his offense before you were ever born, before the world was ever created. God put his offense into place to make peace with sinful man through his son, Jesus, dying on the cross in our place for our sin. And so if you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus, I want to challenge you that today is your day. Now is your time. Give your life to Jesus so that he can pay the fine for your sin, so that your sin could be forgiven, so that you could be made right with God. Give your life to Jesus today. You're at war with God right now. But God loves you so much. 
He planted peace. He planted peace through his son, Jesus, to produce peace with you and me. So if you want to be at peace with God, you want to be right with God today, you want your sin to be forgiven, give your life to Jesus and then jump on our app. Let us know about it. Fill out our connect form and tell us that you're giving your life to Christ today. But watch this. Here's the the greatest news ever. God can't stand your sin, but he loves you anyway. God can't stand your sin, but he loves you anyway. And that's the foundation. That's the starting point for your broken relationship. It's the love of God. It's the love of God that can't stand our sin, but loves us anyways. That's the foundation. That's the starting place for your broken relationships as well. It's the love of God. And so watch this, this great offense that we're talking about today, this in your face offense, a great offense starts with a brokenness over your offense. A great offense starts with a brokenness for your offense. Now next week, we're going to be talking about what's next after the in your face offense. There's one more phase of the game, special teams. But before we get there, you must understand how offensive your own sin is to God. And then you can approach others. This great offense starts with a brokenness over your own sin, over your offense before God. And if you aren't broken over your own sin, then you can't approach people about theirs. If you can't sing the old hymn, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me, and know that you are the wretch the song is talking about, that I am the wretch the song is talking about, that God's grace was so great that it could save someone so sinful and so broken like me. If you aren't there yet, then one, I'm not sure you've understood the gospel, but two, it also means you're not ready to approach other people about their sin. Let's pray. And let's ask God to give us a a brokenness over our own sin. That we might approach people with a peaceful face, face to face. That we might find the ability, the source to make peace, to reconcile our broken relationships. That we might find the love of God that would give us the ability and the, the power to do everything we're talking about today. God, we pray right now in this moment, God, that you would break our hearts over our own sin, over our offense before you, that it would give us the proper spirit and the right heart to even begin to approach those who've hurt us. So God, I pray that right now in this moment, I I know there's probably some people that we realize we need to face, that we need to go face to face and we need to meet with them about the hurt or about the brokenness or about the, the disagreement. God, I pray that you would give us the grace and the power to go and meet with that person face to face. God, would you bring some people maybe to our minds right now that we need to stop talking about to everyone else and we need to go sit down face to face and have that conversation. So God, would you bring those people to our minds right now? And God, I also pray if there's someone that we need to apologize to, that we've hurt, that we would plant peace we would go to that person and we would apologize to them immediately. God, would you give us the strength to plant peace that we might produce peace? It's in your name we pray.